Well, today we're going to continue on with our series on How Do I? And today's message is entitled, How Do I Avoid Being Condemned? How do I avoid being condemned? <laughs> Modern technology, amen. <laughs> well, as, as most of us probably know, before you participate in communion, you really shouldn't partake it if you have any unconfessed sins. And that so that you don't bring damnation upon yourself. So normally before confession, it's good to silently confess any sins you have to Jesus and then take communion service. Now, on one occasion, I tried something a little different, and I asked everyone to take a piece of paper and write down all their unconfessed sins on that piece of paper, bring them up to the altar where we had a little waste basket right below the cross, <clears throat> and then when they came up there to tear those papers up and throw them in the wastebasket. And the reason for this was to signify how Jesus did away with our sins at the cross. So let's begin today's message by asking a question. <clears throat> Do you have a secret sin inside of you that you wouldn't even want to write down out of fear that somebody might See that piece of paper and open it up and find out what you did. Well, let me tell you something about Jesus. Not only does he want to adopt you as his child, but he wants to lift the weight of guilt off our shoulders. That's right. When we come to Christ and accept him as our Lord and Savior, he promises us not only to forgive our sins, right? but he gives us a freedom so that we're not condemned in the future. Let's go to scripture. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. <clears throat> it says, now there is no, no condemnation for who? For those who belong to Christ. And because we belong to him, it says, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed us from the power of sin that leads to death. Now, that's quite a promise, right? So if we belong to Jesus Christ, we'll never be condemned, so there's no reason that we need to fear judgment. We've already been declared innocent. Why? Because of the sacrifice of Jesus. Amen. So let's look at three freedoms this morning that are ours if we trust in Christ. Number one, we're free from the power of sin. Think of it this way. If you stood beside a 747 jet, which is a real large plane, on the runway, right? It's, it's massive weight and size make it seem, how is this thing going to break the holes of gravity and actually take off and fly? This thing is so heavy. But when the power of its engines combines with the laws of aerodynamics, the plane is able to lift itself to 35,000 feet and travel at 600 miles an hour. Now, gravity is still pulling on the plane, right? But as long as it obeys the laws of aerodynamics, it can break free from the bonds of the earth. So if you think about the power of sin in your life, like the pull of gravity on the jet, right? It's always trying to drag us down, trying to get us to do something opposite of God's will or God's aerodynamics, we might say, right? That's how it tries to bring us down. But glory to God, because of the power of the Holy Spirit, we can pull away from the sin, just like the power of those engines on the 747. Now, Romans 8 and 2 says, Because we belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has done what? Has freed us from the power of sin that leads to death. So what has the Spirit done? He's equipped us to pull away from that terrible sin that leads us to death. We're no longer under its control. Thank you, Jesus. We have everything we need within us, the power of the Holy Spirit. And as children of God, we don't have to give in when temptation comes. We are given the ability to withstand the onslaught of the enemy, because residing as us is the Spirit of God himself. 
and he gives us power to be emancipated from the sin that once really held us in bondage. Because it's a fact that we all sin. It's a fact that we sin after we become Christians also. But the sin we commit is not because we don't have control over it. Let me say that again. The sin we commit after we're saved is not because we don't have control over it. No. The sin is committed because for a fleeting moment or perhaps a longer period of time, we've chosen not to exercise our control over sin. Have you ever set a goal of trying to go an entire day without sin? I doubt that many of us have because we're bought into the lie, right, that living a sinful lifestyle is to be expected even for Christians. But wait a minute. God didn't give us the power to overcome sin just for the heck of it, for nothing. He expects us to live a life of holiness committed to the standards that he has laid down for us, not that the world has laid down. Yes, we'll still be sinners, but not willful sinners. We won't truly be without sin, of course, until we reach heaven, right? Now, that doesn't mean we should just do whatever until then, right? So we really don't have any excuse when we give into the sins that we're tempted every day to commit. Now, on the other hand, even when we give in to sin, right, God still forgives us for committing the sin because he loves us. So we're free from sin's powers in really two ways. In one sense, we can control it, so that's a method of freedom, right? And then if we don't control it, we're still forgiven. It's kind of like a bonus, isn't it? But you got to watch out because the danger here lies in thinking, well, hmm, since God has promised us forgiveness, it doesn't make any difference whether I sin or not. But that's still wrong. That's not the, not the case that God had in mind. He expects us to live by not our standards, but his standards. He equips us to live by those standards. He just doesn't expect us to live. He equips us to be able to do that. And he's displeased when we don't live by his standards. Now, like any good father, right, even when we fall short of the standards he'd set, he shows us the way to get back, back on track again and make us whole once again. So we're free from sin's power. What's the next freedom? Well, let's see. We're free from sin's penalty. And we know that the Bible says in Romans 6 and 23, the, the wages of sin is death. Let's, let's look at this for a minute in a little short story. Suppose a man committed murder and he was caught red-handed. Police were right around the corner. They caught him. He admitted to the crime. He decides, well, you know what? I have no choice but to plead guilty. They, they saw me do it. And the day for his trial comes. So he comes up and he enters a plea. The judge hears the man's confession that he's guilty. The judge looks at all the evidence. He knows without a doubt that the man standing before him committed the crime. The judge then rules that the man committed the crime and a penalty was he had to be put to death. But now something weird happens in the courtroom. Instead of punishing the man who commits the crime, the judge stands up and he volunteers to take the death penalty in place of the man and set the man free. By virtue of the judge's personal sacrifice, the man who committed the crime wasn't condemned to suffer the consequences. You might say, what's the chances of that happening? I think none, right? No judge is going to do that, are they? But think about this. Something very similar happened, right, to each one of us. We each sinned against God, and there was no doubt that we were guilty, and we knew the penalty of sin is death. So what does it say in Romans 6 and 23? The wages of sin is death. But God, who is the great what, judge of all times, right, stepped up to the plate and let his son take the hit for us. 
We deserve the penalty of death for our sins, and the penalty was paid not by us, but by Jesus. Romans 3, verse 23. It says, yes, we've all sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious ideal. Yet now God declares us not guilty. Not guilty of offending him if, if we trust in Jesus Christ, who in his kindness freely takes away our sins. Wow. Let's look at Romans 5, verse 8. It says, But God, he showed his great love for us by doing what? Sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. So we're saved then from sin's penalty because Jesus paid the price, right? And the word says we're also saved from God's judgment, so that means we have nothing to fear. Romans 8 and 1. There is no condemnation for those who what? Belong to Jesus Christ. That is a fantastic promise. We've been freed from the penalty of sin, not by our sacrifice, but by Jesus' sacrifice. And when the day of judgment comes, we can rest assured that if we're saved, if we're Christians, truly Christian, we will not come under condemnation like those who aren't saved. So if God's promises are true, and we got to believe that, I believe they are, then we can face that final day with complete assurance, what they say, no worry, right? That we will be ushered into the presence of God. You know, in the movies and TV, a common theme involves a person whose life has been saved by another person willing to somehow pay back that person by doing anything they can to help out, right? Oh, he saved my life. I got to do something to pay him back. Our lives have been saved by God, and there is no way we can pay him back for that. The price he paid is beyond anything we'll ever have to offer. So what can we do? Well, we can change the way we live. That would please him, amen? So when I know that God has literally saved my life and, and I'm free from condemnation forever, I think it lets me walk through life in confidence of the future without having to worry about what's going to happen. It lets me live in obedience to God out of gratitude for what he did instead of fear of God, right? We should still fear the majesty of God, but we should do things out of gratitude for him. It fills my heart with love for God, who loves me so much he let his own son die for my sins. And it also allows me to pray to God with an intimacy unknown to me before. So how do we live like that? How do we live pleasing God? Well, number three, we're free to live by the Spirit. Unfortunately, many of us who are Christians live in what I call spiritual poverty. We're entitled to the gift of the Holy Spirit and his energizing power. And somehow we're not aware of that. We're not aware that that's our birthright. We want to live in obedience to God, but we can't seem to find the power to see it through. Even when the answer is right in front of us, actually it's right within us, if we want to live in gratitude to God, we do so by being empowered by the Holy Spirit, right? So you might think, well, I'm freed from sin's power and I'm freed from sin's condemnation. I want to live by God's standards out of gratitude for what he's done. But you know what? I find it hard to accomplish. Well, maybe the real problem is you don't fully understand the ramifications of what God has actually done for you. If you truly believe he's freed you from sin's power, that means what? You've got the ability not to sin. And if you truly believe he's freed you from sin's penalty, that means you don't need to fear what's going to happen when you get to heaven. So the bottom line to all of this is we're completely free to live a life in obedience to God. Romans 8, second part of verse 3 says, So God 
did what the law could not do. He knew by all those laws in the Old Testament that people could never be 100% perfect. So he sent his own son in a body like the bodies that we have as sinners. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice of our sins. And then in verse 4, he did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow who? Follow the Holy Spirit. Now, before we were Christians, we didn't have a choice. We were enslaved by our sinful nature. We were born into a sinful nature, and we had no power to overcome it. But by accepting Christ and becoming a Christian, we now have a choice. God doesn't force us to do anything. He gives us a choice. We, need, we can either follow our sinful nature or we can follow the Holy Spirit. It's up to us to choose which path. He's given us the power. We already know that only one choice is acceptable to God, who's given himself completely for us, and he didn't do it all, all he's done for us so that we could just keep living the way we are, right? No, he has something better for us, a better life, a life lived in line with his will, not our will, a life lived with the power to do all that he wants us to do, a life lived with an ability to resist all that he wants us to avoid. All of this is ours for the taking if we just listen to the little small voice of the Holy Spirit. You know, when we got to do something wrong, we said, hmm, I don't know if I should really do this or not. That's the Holy Spirit saying, hey, you better check this out. You shouldn't be doing that. Now, I don't have a three-step plan how to make this happen because it's, guess what? It's simpler than that. You and I simply have to make a choice to listen to the Spirit and reject sin. That's it. There's never been a known sin that we've committed that we didn't consciously choose to ignore what the Holy Spirit was saying to us. So check it out. I'm going to give you the formula to be successful in overcoming sin. Probably should write a book on this, right? The only trouble is it's not that complicated. We sin because we choose not to follow the Spirit. And we don't sin when we choose to follow the Spirit. Those are the only two things you have to remember. Simple. So let's begin today to consciously choose to live in the freedom that the Holy Spirit gives us and choose what's right. Here's some homework. Tomorrow, choose to go the entire day without committing any sin. Do you think it's possible? It might be. It might be. Because you can try, though, right? Because if you leave the Spirit in control, you can do it. And then after tomorrow, the next day, make the same choice and keep doing that. Wow. If someday you slip, guess what? God's going to forgive you, and you won't be condemned. He just wants you to try. So get right back up on your feet. Start all over again out of gratitude to our Heavenly Father. That's how we thank Him for saving us, by trying not to sin. Now, if we slip up, He understands that, and He forgives us for that. Well, we learned today that the great news for Christians is that we'll never never be condemned. And I'm looking forward to that day when each of us is ushered past the judgment seat into the presence of Almighty God. And by the way, I can't wait to see each one of you there also. Amen. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for giving us the power over sin, the power to resist sin, not by our power, but that by the power of the Holy Spirit that you have left within each one of us who accepted you as Lord and Savior. We know that we're sinners, Lord, and we will still sin until we join you in heaven. But now 
We have the power not to fall into sin. We have the power to resist it. We just need to listen to that voice of the Holy Spirit when something just doesn't seem like we should be doing it. Thank you for that power, Lord. Help us to listen to it, to clean out our spiritual ears and listen to the power of the Holy Spirit. And use that, what we do is not choosing sin, but choosing to reject sin. Take that as a payment for what you have done for us. We know that we can't repay you for Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. But we can thank you by our obedience to your will and to our obedience to rejecting sin in our lives. And Lord, we don't like to see anybody condemned, so help us to let others know about your love and about your forgiveness so they too can have that same power that we have. Help us not to be selfish with the power that you've given us and let others know that there's nothing they have to worry about in the future if they turn to you, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.